Hello everyone, Gin here. Thank you all for joining us for this, our first anniversary of the Voice of All podcast. It's been an amazing year, filled with ups and downs, and none of it could have happened without you wonderful people. It's hard to believe this all started because I saw people wishing there was an audio version of the story, and I said, well, I have a microphone in four hours. And then it just grew and grew, and now I have over a hundred actors and people doing sound effects, and geez, all the people in this community are just so loving and passionate. Oh, it's great. To all my actors, to all of our supporters on Patreon, to every last person who has ever listened to us read you stories, thank you. I hope to keep bringing you these wonderful stories Wizards keeps giving us and always making them bigger and better. Please look forward to some fantastic things this coming year. I hope to bring you way more stories than is expected of us, who are hoping. And now, something I've been wanting to do for months. It always bugged me that the first story didn't have actors beyond myself. So, now, here it is, entirely redone as best we as a group could do. Without further ado, I give you... Under the Silver Moon A story by Kimberly Crinus Episode 1 of the Shadows Over Innistrad Saga Halana and Elena are trackers, hunters, and protectors who live in the depths of the dark woods that border the edges of Kessig Province, the woods known as the Ulfenwald. Innistrad's ancient forest is their domain, and they have long stood as a bulwark between the horrors within and the innocents without. But of late, things in the woods have begun to shift. You know that feeling? That crawling feeling? Farmer Warren was standing in front of the long table of elders, his plump, wide-eyed wife at his side. Both had turned their backs to the elders in favor of addressing the Gottstaff townsfolk gathered in the cramped parish commons. Halana looked on from the seat closest to the door where she sat next to Elena. It's like a beetle's crawling up the back of your neck. Right up from the base of it and straight into your hair. It was odd, Hal thought, that he should speak of that feeling now, today. She had never heard mention of such a thing before, never known such a sensation was possible. Not until this very morning, she had woken with it, something ticking on the back of her neck, crawling up her spine. It had made her feel unsettled, which in itself was extremely peculiar. So the fact that the feeling, which had crept after her out of their bed at camp, through the woods and into town, should be brought up again so soon after she first felt it, was enough of a strangeness to dredge up another wave of it. She suppressed a shudder of her own. It's so real that you have no choice but to wonder if something's really there, you know? Farmer Warren itched the back of his neck furiously. Seeing him do so made Hal realize she was doing the same. She clasped both hands on her lap. Something horrible could be burrowing under your skin, and you'd never know it. Many a townsfolk twitched and shifted in their seats, itching along with Farmer Warren. Yes, yes. We all know the feeling, Warren, but what's it got to do with why you've come here today before the council? Elder Coleman waved his thick hand as though shooing away a fly. Everything! Farmer Warren turned back to face all eleven of the elders present. They were down from their usual twelve as Elder Somlin was absent due to her performing the second day of death rites to see good Lady Mary into the blessed sleep. That crawling feeling is how I know I'm right. Right about what, Warren? Spit it out already! Elder Glather hollered. One of our cattle is possessed, gone mad, in the middle of the night, and it ate the other one, dragged it all round the pasture first though, I saw the tracks myself, the pain the poor animal must have endured, then the mad one just devoured it, it left nothing behind but the bones and teeth. There were gasps from the townsfolk. 
And how do you know that it was the first cow that ate the second? I saw the blood on its own snout this very morning. Hal looked to Elena. Communication between them required no words. They both knew that Warren's farm was situated at the edge of town. They both knew it abutted the woods of the Ulfenwald. And they both knew what beasts had, of late, made a fateful resurgence in their forest. In the span of a fortnight, Elena and Hal had each, on their own, dispatched three lycanthropes. And in addition, together they had taken out a whole pack. Small, but certainly a pack. Just the night before. But those encounters had all been far enough from Gottstaff to not raise concern. Hal having followed a distant Hal halfway down the Bower Passage, and the one Elena had taken was out at the Natter Knolls. But now, their shared look said there was reason to believe the beasts had become brazen, that they were working their way to the fringes of the woods, to the towns, to the people. That was unacceptable. The Ulfenwald was Elena's and Hal's domain, and they would not let its dark horrors leak out to harm the innocent. Our wards! Wife Warren's wail drew Hal's attention back to the front of the room. She made our shoddy wards! The farmer's wife thrust an accusatory finger in the direction of good lady Evelyn, who gasped and clutched at the ward at her neck. She made them and they failed! It couldn't have been the wards! Lady Evelyn makes the best and most potent wards this town, nay, this land, has ever seen. Order! Elder Coleman shouted and pounded his thick, flat hand on the table of elders, but he was ignored. Then how do you explain the possessed cow? The tracks that show it dragged the other around our farm? The bones it left behind after feeding? Aye! The wards didn't do their work. There can be no doubt. The wards fail and our cow was possessed. Farmer Warren seemed to have gathered courage to speak from the rallying of so many townsfolk to his cause. He held tight to his own ward and beseeched both the townsfolk and the elders. We are the victims of Lady Evelyn's neglect. We cannot afford to go one more night without a proper ward. There was a rabble of agreement. It made sense to Hal that the townsfolk would blame it on faulty wards that they would think their cow possessed by an evil spirit. These were things they could define. These were things that they had the means to put right. Things that did not upset the careful balance that they believed to govern their world. They did not live in the same reality that Hal and Elena did. The townsfolk didn't see what happened in the darkness, in the woods. They lived in a world protected by the light of the angel Avacyn. They believed themselves safe from things like werewolves. But even in Avacyn's world, the werewolves were never completely wiped out. Lycanthropes had had a constant presence in the Ulfenwald, significantly diminished though it was. Hal and Elena would know. They had heard the lycanthropes' unearthly howls echoing off the trees, a permanent fixture in the forest's deepest reaches. Thinking of their howls, Hal shifted uncomfortably in her chair. The crawling feeling returned to the back of her neck. A howl was what she had heard, what had brought on the unwelcome feeling in the first place. She had first thought she had dreamt it. The fight earlier that same night with the pack had been playing out in her dreams. It had been some time since she and Elena had faced a pack. It had also been some time since they had faced so many lycanthropes in such a short span. Hal had been seeing flashes of their muzzles, their muscles, their haunches in her mind as she had laid in bed, so she had not been surprised that she woke thinking she had heard a howl. But now, looking at the bulging eyes of Wife Warren's face, she worried that the howl had not been in her head had not been a memory, nor a dream, but the sound of a real and true beast. The very beast, in fact, that had dared to come into the town, had dared to feast on the Warren's domestic cattle. It would not be allowed to do so again. Shall we? Hal mouthed the invitation to Elena. Elena's face lit up, the glow of the hunt already upon her. Together they rose, 
Hal's fingers tingled in anticipation, her eyes on the handle of the nearby door. The door that in the next instant flew open. Innkeeper Shorin and his wife Elsa charged into the parish hall. Ring the town bell! She's gone! She's dead! He killed her! Any order that Elder Coleman had succeeded in restoring in the last moments went out the window. The townsfolk howled and shrieked and jumped to their feet. Oh, the poor girl! The blood was all over. I... I can't imagine what he did with her body. I knew he was a depraved and wicked man. I knew it from the moment they came to the inn, from the moment they came to town. The Palters. Elena nodded in confirmation. It was obvious who the victim and accused were supposed to be. The Palters from Gavany. They were currently the only guests at the inn, the only guests the inn had seen in the last three months. Hal and Elena had found the Cathar and his wife themselves no more than a week ago, wandering the deep paths of the Ulfenwald up near Bower Passage. Of course, Hal and Elena had helped them. Of course, they had seen the two out of the Twisted Wood and Tagatstaff, fighting off no fewer than three wolves, one ghoul, and a possessed oak on the way. Hal smiled at the memory of Elena's swift dispatching of the tree. The highly skilled tracker had improved her grappling skills so significantly over the past year that Hal wouldn't be surprised if she could take down a giant scab without any sort of outside assistance. The Palters had thanked Hal and Elena in kind, or at least Mr. Palter had, for his wife had been so shocked by the trials of traversing the dark wood that her slender form had retreated entirely under the hood of her riding cloak. Mr. Palter, who explained he was a Cathar of the Lunar Council, insisted on giving Hal and Elena a token of protection, one that he had used many times, he claimed, to help him in his duty as guard of the mausoleum. Hal and Elena had taken the token politely, but it meant little to them, for they did not believe in the need for such things. Not when they had each other. Ring the bell! There is a murderer on the loose in our town! Hal would not have thought the Palters, either one, to be a murderer. The Cathar was kindly, his wife most obliging, if slightly fragile. Could it be that this too was the lycanthrope? It certainly seemed so. Come on! Elena hissed, gesturing toward the door, which was no longer barricaded. The two innkeepers had moved farther into the fray, embraced by the folds of townsfolk who were hungry for further details of the gruesome happenings. Hal and Elena slipped easily through the crowd without drawing attention. They were well practiced at moving by stealth, and in two quick, lithe strides, they were out the door and on the cobbled street. So it... Or they... Yes, or they... This could have been the work of a pack, another pack, that would make two packs that were in relatively close proximity in one night. That hasn't happened in some time. She cast a glance at Elena, who did not look back, so focused was she on their heading. Either way, the lone lycanthrope or the pack attacked within the boundaries of Gat's staff at least twice last night. Once the cow at the Warrens' farm. And once Mrs. Poulter in the Shoren's Inn. Hal abruptly halted in her tracks, and her hands flew to cover her gaping mouth. Her mind had just put something together. What is it? It's shocking, to be sure. But where the townsfolk are far off on their assumption of the possessed cow, they are not so far off at all in properly identifying the one responsible for Mrs. Palter's murder. Hal hurried to catch up. Elena cocked her head in question. In the inn. In the inn. Hal could see the work of her mind behind her eyes. In the Poulter's room. Behind a locked door. With no mention of a broken window or forced entry. As one, they changed course, running for the Shorin's Inn. The tolling of the town bell continued, far past the point of being any useful sort of alarm. From the sound of it, Hal thought it likely that Elsa Shorn herself had come into possession of the rope, 
having most likely wrestled it from the hands of the bell ringer. If that was the case, then all the better. The distraction Elsa was most likely providing to the elders, who would be left in turn to wrestle the rope from her hands, would afford Hal and Elena more time to search the Poulter's chambers. They made their way past the desk in the reception area and stalked down the hall. Hal nodded ahead to the only door that was left ajar, no doubt by the harried innkeeper and his wife after having witnessed the scene of a murder. Hal moved into the room first, and Elena followed, neither disturbed the angle of the open door. The metallic scent of blood hit the back of Hal's throat on her first breath. This way. She wound past a toppled chair in the small foyer and back toward the dimly lit bedroom. She sensed Elena tense. Though the candles were snuffed and the curtains drawn, there was enough light for them to see the pool of dark blood on the floor. Elena, Hal knew, had not tensed out of fear. She wasn't the kind of girl to become afraid at the sight of blood. The stillness was her way of focusing her senses. Hal had learned much of her own skill in tracking from studying Elena. She imitated Elena now, becoming motionless, so that she could be more sensitive to the clues around her. Looking at the vast, dark pool, her thoughts turned to the slight woman whose blood this was. Hal only let her mind dwell there for a moment, and for that moment, she allowed herself to feel pain and pity for the woman. Mrs. Poulter was an innocent who had lost her life to one she so trusted. Hal glanced up at Elena. How terrifying those last moments must have been. How awful the realization. But she could not dwell on the feelings of sorrow. It would do no good in the work they had to do next. Careful not to disturb so much as a drop of blood, Hal stalked the perimeter of the small, square room, moving about it clockwise as Elena moved in the opposite direction. Three clues presented themselves without hesitation. A torn bit of lace, a toppled candle lying in a puddle of its own hardened wax, and a silver button. It was the button that held Hal's attention. As she came round the perimeter to meet Elena again, she pointed to where it lay on the floor, near the pool of blood. Tell me if I am mistaken, but wasn't Cathar Palter wearing a green vest with three buttons, just such as that one when we met him in the woods? Elena's look was somber. Your memory is as accurate as always, I fear. Then it is true. His transformation occurred in this room. He killed his own wife, and then fled through the Warrens' farm, snacking again, and then into the woods. Yes, so it seems. Hal could tell by Elena's voice that she wasn't convinced. Not entirely. What is it? What has caught your eye? Elena gestured to the pool of blood. I cannot help but wonder. The blood is here. So much of it on the floor. But what of the bones? The bits of flesh? The hair and fabric? The things the beast would not have devoured? Hal stepped back, taking in the scene with fresh eyes. Elena's was an important question to ask. But before Hal's mind could settle into answering it, something else claimed her attention. Behind Elena, the door of the closet was cracked, just enough for Hal to make out what was inside. At the sight, Hal's heart quickened. Elena noticed immediately. Her brow furrowed in question, and she turned to look over her own shoulder. They both stood staring for a long moment. In the closet was a chair. It was an ordinary enough chair, besides the fact that it was sitting in the closet. But that in itself wouldn't have been enough cause for a concern, and that had not been what had sent Hal's heart to hammering in her chest. It was the leather straps and belts that hung from the chair. More than a dozen, of all lengths, ripped and shredded, that had given her pause. And there were three locks, one on the chair's seat, and two on the floor. That seals it then. He knew. Of course he did. We must stop him. We should... 
But she never finished her thought, because in one fluid motion, Hal wrapped her arm around Elena's midsection, drawing the girl to her breast and pulling her into the shadows. Together, they stood still and silent. They were so well practiced in this form of concealment that their breaths instinctively fell into sync, low and shallow, difficult even for the most astute of creatures to detect. It had been the silence that had alerted Hal, or at least the lack of clamoring noise, which had been sounding continuously up until that point. The bell was no longer ringing. That would mean that the murder investigation was on. The din of echoing footsteps and muffled voices confirmed it. The townsfolk were headed to the scene of the crime, to the very room where Hal and Elena were now pressed into the corner. The creaking of the door to the inn said to Hal and Elena that they could not go out the way they had come, at least not without needlessly arousing suspicion. As a rule, they avoided run-ins with the townsfolk whenever possible. The townsfolk tolerated Hal and Elena. They accepted the presence of the trackers in Gottstoff whenever the two came to town because they had aided visitors and townsfolk alike on their journeys through the Ulfenwald. But at the same time, the townsfolk knew that Hal and Elena lived in the dark woods, and for that reason, they were considered other. Glances were cast, suspicions shared in hushed voices, and prayers uttered in passing. Hal sensed as much fright as dislike on the sense of those to whom she came too near. It would do no good to be found at the scene of a murder. Elena nodded to the window in the back of the bedroom, the one that opened into the alley. Perfect. Hal smiled at Elena's ever-dependable adeptness at getting them out of tight situations. On their way out, Hal carefully and quietly closed the door to the closet. There was no reason for the townsfolk to see the thing that would so rattle and upset them. No point in stirring up such worry that would surely come with even the barest hints of the presence of a lycanthrope. The people need not believe they were being hunted, for they were not. Hal and Elena would handle this. They would protect the innocent. The Ulfenwald and its threats were for them to manage, and they would. They timed the opening of the window with the banging open of the outer door to the room. The sliding of wood over wood as they closed the window was then drowned out by the thumping of heavy boots and competing baritone voices as the elders and other townsfolk flooded the room. Hal and Elena climbed down into the alley without any of the townsfolk being the wiser. They hadn't much time. The sun was already kissing the horizon when they arrived back at their camp deep in the Ulfenwald. Each quickly, but deliberately, strapped on her silver. Of course, they always carried one small blade of it, it would be foolish to be completely unprepared, but until recent events there had seemed no need to carry more. Now they found both the need and the means to carry nearly all of it with them silver-tipped arrows, swords, spears, and daggers. The metal gleamed with power. As soon as they were equipped, they left their camp again. Moving as one, they navigated the maze of brambles Hal had planted around their home as a safety measure and pressed out into the darkening woods. Elena was first to pick up on Cathar Palter's trail. She was often the first to get a scent. Her nose, though petite and perfectly round in a way that set her whole face alight when she laughed, was also sharp and discerning. Her skill was well honed. Hal found the scent only moments later, recognizing it from the room of the inn, and saw the boot prints an instant after that. Together, they stalked the murderous lycanthrope. His tracks wound around the twisted trees, seeming to say either that he was lost, or more likely that he was struggling with himself, with the animal that he was inside. Hal imagined that same struggle was what had driven him to pick up his life and leave Gavany. He must have killed there, most likely more than once. 
and when he realized the horrors he had committed, he doubtless had no longer been able to face the people whose lives he had affected. So he had fled. It wasn't odd behavior. Not for a lycanthrope. What was stranger was bringing his wife along with him. The poor soul. Hal could not reconcile that behavior with the impression of kindness and compassion she had gotten from Mr. Palter when they had found the couple in the woods. She wished to give the Cathar the benefit of the doubt. Perhaps he had intended to leave Mrs. Palter in the safety of a new town, away from any suspicions that might be cast her way because of his actions, somewhere that he could believe her to one day start anew and find happiness. Then. Maybe he planned to sequester himself to the wood, or worse. She imagined that's what she would do, if ever the curse was transmitted to her, perish the thought. She would not, she could not, put Elena in danger. She would leave. She would have no choice but to go very, very far away. And she would do so, all the while, knowing that her heart would never mend. Perhaps the act in itself would be enough to stop her heart from beating altogether. Oh, what a mercy that would be. If that is what Mr. Poulter had tried to do, Hal felt nothing but the deepest sympathy for him. That is, until the next moment when she thought of Mrs. Poulter's blood on the floor. Regardless of his intentions, Mr. Falter had failed the one he loved. He had not been strong enough, and his shortcomings had resulted in the end of her life. As though in response to Hal's shifting feelings toward the Cathar, his tracks shifted too. It became clear when his transformation had taken place. For one moment, Hal and Elena were following the boot prints of a man, and the next they were tracking the paw prints of a beast. They moved along the lycanthrope's path, until abruptly and unexpectedly, they came to a crossroads. Hal and Elena eyed the split trail at their feet, visible thanks to the light of the silver moon. From the point where they stood, Cathar Poulter had gone two different directions, surely at two different times. He must have gone one way first and then, at some points, near or far from this intersection, it was hard to say, double back and gone the other. East to Gatstaff, or west to the deep woods. It seems our beast was fighting an inner struggle. Hal nodded. It did not surprise her that, though she had not vocalized her theory, Elena's mind had landed in the same place. So, which way did he go first? Where is he now? Did he let his cravings drive him to town, then at some point retreat? Elena looked into the wood. Or did he try to overcome, only to be driven back to town by his cravings? Hal looked at the town. We have to go to the town. They ran. The point at which the tracks emerged from the Ulfenwald was at the edge of the Warren's farm. That was unsurprising. Lycanthropes were known to return to feeding grounds that had proved fertile in the past. But Mr. Poulter had not fed there this night. At least not yet. The proof of it was that one of the Warren's two cows remained standing far to the side of the field, its back toward the tracks in the pasture, which Hal could make out now in the light of the moon. They were, as wife Warren had described, thick and curved, as though a heavy body had been dragged over the tall grass, round and round, compressing the blades beneath it as it went. Sorry, animal. Hal wandered into the tracks, tracing the path the lycanthrope must have taken. This was strange work for one so bestial in nature. Why not just feed? Perhaps he was fighting his urges, even then. A picture of who Cathar Palter was began to form in Hal's mind. He was a good man, a kind man, a man of the church. His intentions, it seemed, were in the right place, even when he was not of his right mind. I've lost a scent completely. Elena's words brought Hal back to herself. As she joined Elena in a search to pick up the lycanthrope's trail, she reminded herself that intentions were nothing without action. She and Elena would have to kill the werewolf. Murder! There's been a murder! It's the bell ringer! Oh, poor Orwell is dead! Then came the ringing of the bell. 
the rope once again pulled by Lady Elsa herself, no doubt. Elena and Hal wasted no time. Before Lady Elsa's voice had ceased echoing, they were moving through the night like two shadows. Concealed in the dark alcoves, they closed in on the press of townsfolk who had gathered round the bell. Careful, silent posturing allowed them to see through the massive shoulders and necks to the pool of dark blood on the ground at the base of the bell tower. There was no mistaking the pattern. This was the work of Mr. Palter. The lycanthrope had killed again. As though in confirmation of Hal's conclusion, a howl sounded from the Ulfenwald. Without a word, Hal and Elena took flight toward the woods. But before they were out of sight of the square, Hal glanced back over her shoulder. Something about the scene niggled at the back of her mind. There was no time to wonder what it was, however. She turned back toward the trees. They were on the hunt. Entering the woods through the Warren's farm, it was easy to pick up the large lupine tracks again. They followed the trail past the point where it diverged, this time moving west, deeper into the forest. Hal realized where they were headed, the hinge of old Avabrook, the lost capital. It was a place of geists and werewolf scavengers. Perhaps they would face more foes than just the ones they were pursuing. As she ran, Hal touched the hilts of her favorite dagger, ready to defend her woods. Suddenly, Elena held up her hand and ground to a halt. Hal nearly trampled her, but managed to stop just before colliding, her eyes on the sight that had given Elena pause. There before them, on the forest floor, was the body of the bell ringer. Orwell was ghostly white, his skin withered for lack of blood in his body. A body that was, for the most part, intact. His limbs were splayed out as though they had been carefully arranged, and all around him the underbrush and grass had been tromped down as though something heavy had been dragged over it. Something was not right. There should not be a body. The beast should have fed. Senses on high alert, Hal and Elena stalked the scene, Elena at the perimeter and Hal along the path of dragging. She knew it before she paced it out. The shape of it, the look of the curves, it was the same shape as the marks in the pasture at the Warren's farm. This made no sense. Was this the result of some sort of ritual? Was this tracing of a pattern something Mr. Palter did to resist the urge to consume? What kind of lycanthrope were they dealing with? Hal looked to Elena to ask that very question, but Elena's eyes were glued to a place further on into the woods, barely lit by the light of the moon. Hal followed Elena's gaze and saw it too. A second body. When they approached, they found that the same that had been done to the bell ringer had been done to the ward maker, Lady Evelyn, appendages splayed, grass beat down. And just beyond was the body of Elder Somlin. Again, the same pattern in the grass, the same arrangement of the arms and legs. Elder Somlin was to have been seeing to the death rites. But then she must never have been given the chance. Look. Hal pointed to a detail that made her hand tremble. It was the lace of Elder Somlin's blouse. It matched the bit of lace that had been left behind in the palter's room at the inn. And there, at the cuff of the Elder's sleeve, they could see the gap where the bit they found would have fit. If Elder Somlin was the victim at the inn, if that was her blood, then what of Mrs. Palter? The crawling feeling returned to Hal this time running straight up from her tailbone to the top of her skull. The shiver that passed through her was augmented by the vibrations of the howl that rang out at that very moment in the night. And what of Mr. Palter? I believe it's time to find out. Elena darted off in the direction of the howl, and Hal followed. As they ran, Hal noticed that they were moving parallel to another's trail. She adjusted her heading to align herself with the tracks. They were boot prints. Mr. Palter's boots. Something in Hal's mind clicked. What is it, Hal? 
even through the trees, even at a sprint, Elena had sensed the shift in Hal. The moment of transformation. Hal's mind was racing along with her feet, putting together pieces, struggling to find an answer to a question that she did not know how to ask. If it happened there, back in the woods... It did. We both saw the proof of it. His human prints, and then the looping ones. No. We saw boot prints. And we saw paw prints. Separately. Yes. But if they were from the same feet, then where were the boots themselves? Elena slowed in her gait, almost imperceptibly, but Hal noticed. She had the girl's attention. Hal pointed to the ground at her feet. And why do we see boot prints again here? Elena stared at the ground as they ran, taking in the sight of the boot prints. What if... Hal began when she believed Elena to have had enough time to put the pieces together herself. It is not Mr. Poulter. What if the lycanthrope is? Mrs. Poulter's name was caught on Hal's lips because in the moment she was about to speak it, they had crested a hill, from the top of which they were able to see a small clearing. And in that clearing, there was what looked to be a makeshift altar made of twisted stone. The altar was uneven poorly constructed, and atop it lay the good Cathar Palter. Standing behind him, her hood pulled down over her face, as it was when they had met her the first time in this wood, was Mrs. Palter. Her arms were raised above the body of her husband, and she was chanting. It was demonic chanting. Hal recognized the intonations and deep, guttural sounds. Armandal! 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 The name was clear. This woman was in contract with a horror. This. Please. Hal's heart lifted upon hearing the weak voice. Good Cathar Palter was still alive. Be silent! His wife spat. She drew a blade. Hal and Elena both lurched forward, racing toward the small clearing. Mrs. Palter looked up at the sound of their approach, but only in time to glimpse their forms as they tackled her to the ground. Though her body bucked and her arms thrashed, with more strength than Hal had previously given her credit for, they managed to hold her pinned. Elena drew her own blade. No. Don't hurt her. Hal glanced up at the Cathar. She was trying to kill you. Let her go. Please. She doesn't know. Oh, she doesn't know what she's doing. It was her, wasn't it? She killed them. All of them. Elena held her blade to Mrs. Palter's neck. The Cathar did not deny it. The blood in your room at the inn that morning. That was Elder Somlin's blood, wasn't it? You knew what she was capable of when you left Gavany. When you brought her to Gatstaff. You tried to bind her in the closet, but the straps could not hold the evil that possessed her. And then she got out. She tried to kill at the Warren's farm. She etched her demonic markings into the ground, but you stopped her. However, after that you lost control. You followed her around the town, unable and unwilling to stop her from collecting her victims. So instead you brought them here, to hide them to hide her. One after another, you moved the bodies. Three bodies, Mr. Poulter. She killed three innocents. It's my fault. It's all my fault. The mausoleum was under my guard. Whatever emerged from it, I could have stopped it. Hal doubted that very much. The demon's name, Warmandal. She had heard it before. And from the stories she knew of it, it was not a demon that a single mausoleum guard, no matter how good-hearted and well-intentioned, could have stopped. For the third time that night, her heart went out to Mr. Palter. But her sympathy for him was not enough for her to consider letting Mrs. Palter free. For the woman was lost. What was left writhing under Hal and Elena's grip was not Mr. Palter's wife. 
That would be an impossible thing for him to understand. Hal nodded to Elena, who readied to plunge her blade. But just then, Mr. Poulter half fell, half launched himself off the altar, his body crashing into Hal and Elena. In that instant, their shared grip was loosened, just enough for the cursed woman to free herself. Mrs. Poulter leapt to her feet, and Hal could feel the power collecting within the slender waif of a woman. Then Mrs. Poulter opened her mouth wide and roared down at Hal and Elena. The sound was not unlike a werewolf's howling. Something gripped Hal's mind as she and Elena sprang for the woman. What about the werewolf? The pieces still didn't fit. The tracks in the forest? They had been clear lupine prints. The cow that had been devoured, properly devoured with the bones and teeth left behind. It was not Mrs. Poulter's doing, was it? Hal's contemplations caused her to miss a swift, dodging movement from Mrs. Poulter that she would have easily countered had she been entirely focused on the brawl at hand. Mrs. Poulter moved more swiftly than she should have been able to, and before Hal could compensate for her lapsed attention, Mrs. Poulter dove out of her reach and in one motion tackled and stabbed her husband through the chest. Hal and Elena were on her before she could pull the knife out to stab again, but the damage was already done. The fading gurgling from the good Cathar confirmed it. It was nearly impossible to hold Mrs. Poulter to the ground. So powerful were each of her movements, fueled by her demonic contract, that it took the two of them to hold back just one arm. But Hal and Elena were well practiced. It was much like grappling a Moldgraf monstrosity, and now Hal had turned all of her attention to the physical battle. Though Mrs. Poulter fought with all her might to stand, all she was able to succeed in doing was lift her head. As she did, her hood fell off. For the first time since they had met her in the woods, Hal and Elena looked upon Mrs. Poulter's face. So disfigured was it by the power of the demon that had coursed through her time and again. So appalling was the molted flesh that Hal cried out. Mrs. Poulter smiled, and she began to chant. And as she did, her irises changed from pale blue to dark, glistening black. The black spread quickly to fill the entirety of her eyes. Hal looked to Elena, who was struggling just as much as she to just hold Mrs. Poulter down. There was nothing they could do when the woman called upon the enormous amount of demonic power she had summoned and threw them off of her. Hal shot through the air until her side smacked into the thick trunk of a tree. Pain radiated out from her shoulder and the side of her head as she collapsed to the ground. She struggled to get up, to force her limbs to move the way she wanted them to, to compel her vision to focus from three panels to one. The pain in the side of her head was like a blade that was rammed through the whole of her body, pushing her down. But she could not let it. She would not, for she could see there before her, Elena, falling to one blow after another from Mrs. Poulter's thrashing fists. Though Elena jumped up every time, she was no match for the well of strength that seemed to be endlessly flowing from the cursed woman. And then Mrs. Poulter reached for her blade. No! Hal's cry, though fed by her desperation, barely made a sound. She fought against the weakness in her limbs, pushing herself to her feet. But she was not fast enough. Mrs. Poulter's blade came down. Hal's strangled scream was never heard because it was overwhelmed by the sound of a lycanthrope snarl. Mrs. Poulter's blade was stopped, and the woman was thrown to the ground by the single swipe of a wolf's forelimb. Her blood flew everywhere, whipping off the teeth and claws of the giant beast. Elena rolled away from the fray, and Hal was at her side in an instant. Together they plunged their blades into Mrs. Poulter's raging, bloody form. As the demonic curse drained from the woman's lifeless limbs, her body deflated and wilted to the ground at their feet. This left Hal and Elena standing shoulder to shoulder, face to face with a massive, panting lycanthrope. 
Before they could act, before they could even communicate their intentions to each other, there was a snarl from the trees to their left, and then one from their right, one behind, two in front. Then all around them, they saw glowing yellow eyes, reflecting and tarnishing the light of the silver moon. They were surrounded. How many were there? A dozen, perhaps two. Hal felt Elena tense. This was not Elena's usual firm, grounding stance. The girl was rigid, strained. Hal raised her bloody dagger, locking eyes with the biggest of the lycanthropes, the one standing before them. If they were to die here, tonight, it would not be without a fight. But even as she prepared to strike, the lycanthrope changed its form. It happened so quickly that Hal barely registered it. Suddenly, the beast was a human woman, with hard lines and a striking figure. The silver moon shone off the woman's pale skin and glistened off the white tips of her long hair. Never before had Hal seen a lycanthrope turn back to human form in the heat of battle. Never. It was impossible. Yet here it had happened. For a moment, none of the three of them moved. Then Hal held up her dagger and, very slowly, keeping eye contact with the woman, set it on the ground. Elena shifted and cast a questioning look at Hal, but registering Hal's certainty, she proceeded to do the same. Hal thought she saw a very slight nod from the naked woman before them, and then the woman turned to the rest of the surrounding pack, all of them breathing heavy, battle-ready, hungry. The woman shook her head once, short and sharp. A whimper sounded in response, just one, and then the pack turned and disappeared into the trees of the Ulfenwald. Hal and Elena were left alone with the woman, who had just saved their lives. Hal cleared her throat. She was going to say thank you, but the words would not come. Instead, she unbuttoned her outer coat and offered it to the woman. Thank you. The woman took Hal's coat, shouldering it on. Thank you. I did not do it for you. I have been tracking her. She nodded to Mrs. Palter. And others like her. There are too many in our towns. So it was your tracks, and you who ate the cow. If it was not for my desire to end her wretched life, I would not have saved your lives. But seeing as you have been left alive, I will tell you this only once. You must cease your killing of my pack. The werewolves. If you do not, I will be forced to move against you, and when I do, I will end you. This is our woods. The Olvenwald is under our protection. We cannot allow werewolves in our domain. It is not up to you. And it is foolish of you to think that just the two of you could keep this wood safe from what is coming. Foolish to think you can even stay alive here yourselves. Leave the woods, little hunters. Leave the woods to us. We would never... Elena clenched her hands into fists. What is coming? I don't know. Elena snorted, but Hal was not distracted. There was something about this woman that made Hal heed her words. I don't know exactly, but I have seen enough, and so have you, to know that whatever is out there is worse than werewolves. This world will need us soon. It will welcome the sound of our howl, the muscle of our pack. We may be the only force that can stand against whatever it is that is threatening it. We will stand against whatever threatens the Elven world. There is nothing we won't face. <sighs> if you stay here, you will face your deaths. She dropped Hal's outer coat from her shoulders. You did not perish tonight only because I intervened. Only because of a werewolf. Consider that. Or don't, it is up to you. But know that I am advising you to leave. Get out of the Ulvenwald, and when you do, stay out. And pray, if that is something you do. We will not. 
Elena began, but the woman had already slipped back into her wolf form. Her transformation was nothing like the usual, brutal, bulging transformations that Hal had witnessed in other lycanthropes. This woman was not a usual werewolf. With a final snarl, she turned away from them and glided off into the trees. Hal and Elena were left standing in the filtered moonlight deep in the dark woods. Once more, the crawling sensation returned to Hal, fingers running up her spine. She could not help her body from shuddering. The feeling was not because of the lycanthrope. It was because of something else entirely. Something Hal did not yet know or understand. Elena looked to her, daring in her eyes, poised to run. But Hal was unsure of which way they should go. Arlen Cord darted between the tangled trees. The foolish humans. How could they be so blind? She hoped she would not be forced to kill them one day. They were strong and wild, characteristics she valued. In another life, she might have befriended them. But this was not that life. In this life, Arlen could not have friends. Thank you for listening to this production of Voice of All. As listener-supported entertainment, we rely on you, not just for the voices of the characters, but also to keep us going and growing. If you enjoyed what you heard, please support us by rating and reviewing us on iTunes, or following us on SoundCloud and Google Play, or just plain sharing it with your friends. You can also support us financially on Patreon for exclusive perks. Under the Silver Moon was written by Kimberly Krinus. The podcast was produced and edited by Gen Dokeshi, with sound editing by Isa Martel. This week's story featured the voice talents of Yoon Oe, Sarah Brown, J.W. Forsyth, Brian Rosek, Christina Edelman, Gate Geek, Ash Thurman, Sam Parrish, Grace, Liam Wilson, and Red. Magic the Gathering is copyright Wizards of the Coast. Thank you for listening, and have a good day. Sometimes when this place gets kind of empty The sound of the breath fades with the light I think about a werewolf infestation Under the silver moon tonight Lower the curtain down on Hanweir Lower the curtain down, all right I got no time for private consultation Under the silver moon tonight I wish I knew what you were looking for I might have known what you would find And it's something quite peculiar A man being sacrificed by his wife It leads you here Despite your destination under the silver moon tonight I wish I knew what you were looking for I might have known what you would find I wish I knew what you were looking for 
Might have known what you would find And it's something quite peculiar Something shimmering and white Leads you here Despite your destination Under the silver moon tonight